there, everyone! Welcome to episode number 572 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. This week, I am delighted to welcome co-founder of Animals Around the Globe, Christopher Weber, to Fish Fry. Christopher and I explore the intersection of wildlife and technology. We chat about the importance of wildlife tracking, the trends Christopher is seeing in this arena, and some new technologies being used today to track wildlife around the world. Also this week, I check out new bionic jellyfish that could be used to gather climate science data from deep in the Earth's oceans. But first, please welcome Christopher from Animals Around the Globe to Fish Fry. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Okay, so first off, tell my audience about Animals Around the Globe. Yeah, Animals Around the Globe, I co-founded around four years ago with a colleague of mine. We both worked at Google at the time, and we started this as our own passion product, let's say, or project, because we both have a huge love for wildlife and wanted to form like kind of business around it. So we started with a little blog. Essentially, our goal was to giving animals a global stage and fostering our harmonious relationship between humans and animals. That grew a lot over the last four years, very healthily. We have now over 20 million page views per month, 90% from the US. And we have built out a team that is not only now doing blogs, but we're also doing news articles, YouTube videos, podcasts, and so on. So we built a whole ecosystem around it and are on the way to becoming a very big media company focused on animal content. And we are super excited to do that, especially if we look into the future and want to show how humans behave to maybe less intelligent species like animals. If we are judged by any means by AI in the future, we want to show that we as a species, we have a good heart and are protective of other species as well. Fantastic. Okay. So Chris, let's talk about the intersection of wildlife and technology. Yeah. First, tell my audience about why tracking wildlife is so important. So, I mean, tracking wildlife is super crucial for a few reasons. On one side, it helps understand animal behaviors, migration patterns, population dynamics. Also, on the other side, it's very important for conservation efforts which allows us to protect endangered species in the end, because this can help later on watch out for poachers or see how the numbers are doing of the animals. Yeah, so many reasons why it is important to do. Okay, so what kind of trends are you seeing when it comes to wildlife tracking? And what kind of technologies do you see being used? Yeah, interesting question. We are seeing, I mean, fascinating trends in wildlife tracking, especially in the use of advanced technologies, AI-powered data analysis, drone surveillance, a lot of GPS tracking. These tools allow for real-time monitoring and highly detailed data collection. They help researchers and conservationists make informed decisions. We visited a few conservation camps recently in Africa, and we saw some interesting trends there as well on the ground. For instance, one of them, they were using on one side drones to patrol their territory and see if any poachers would try to sneak into their territory and poach. In this case, it was about rhinos, and then they could in real time almost intercept them. Then the other technology, they were using a lot of night cameras with night vision to also have more surveillance over the rhinos. Another interesting sighting we made was in Kruger National Park. There are actually a lot of cameras set up on normal roads that are watching out for wildlife and for poachers. Can't really pass any road without being seen, which also is preventing poaching in that area. It's just one layer of protection, but one of many. Then 
obviously like trap cams are still used in all of these areas to, to see if rare species are coming through or what the migration pattern looks like. Because in the end, the goal of a lot of African countries and other countries is to make space for more wild space, because the larger these territories and national parks are, the closer we get to the original migration routes of animals and technology like cameras and drones help us to track that and our progress towards that. So tell me specifically about how animals around the globe is utilizing technology. On the content side, we are at an interesting intersection right now between AI and human brain power. We're still at the point where AI can't completely be creative and get out the right trends and write about the, the right topics. So we combine the human engine or the human mind with AI tools to help writing certain sections or creating animal maps to showcase, for instance, their migration patterns, or how it used to look like. These are all great tools and help, for instance, our designers, our writers to be more effective and in the way we communicate. Chris, where do you see technology being used for wildlife tracking headed in the future? I think drones will play a really big part when it comes to conservation and migration and animal counting. For instance, one of the reserves we visited in Africa recently, they used to, to count all the animals in their park or in their territory. They had to fly with a plane over that field or drive through it and try to count. Now they have a drone that scans the whole territory and automatically with machine learning can count which animals and how many animals of that species are on the territory. So within half an hour, instead of a few weeks, they can count all animals that they have. And this is just one example. As battery life for drones increases, we can have drones up in the air basically all the time and track any movement day or night with, for instance, poachers trying to enter the property and have real life data and being like, where are they and where do we intersect them? So I think drones will play a huge role and the increase of battery life and AI power will help all reserves to stay safe. Because once a drone detects a poacher, then the reserve can unleash either dogs or a trained unit and catch the poachers directly. All right. Well, Chris, I think it's time for your off-the-cuff question. So here's our standard off-the-cuff. Now, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? <laughs> Well, so I'm German and my uh, granddad comes from the more like southern mountainous area and he made a homemade, uh, it's called Kässpätzle, which is a German kind of pasta with a certain type of cheese and, and onions. <laughs> it, it's not very healthy, but it tastes amazing. So that's what I would have. <laughs> Oh, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Well, I think that's all I have time for today, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Thank you as well, Amelia. Thanks for having me on the show. What if we could employ jellyfish to be deep sea explorers? Sounds a little crazy, right? But that is exactly the idea that motivated new research at Caltech that aims to create a new kind of deep sea explorer the biohybrid robotic jellyfish. So these new seafaring robots can be thought of as an ocean-going cyborg because they are actually jellyfish that have been augmented with electronics. And these electronics can enhance their swimming by making them swim in a more streamlined manner and allow them to carry a small payload in a prosthetic hat. So, this new research, which was recently published in the journal called Bioinspiration and Biomimetics, was led by John DeBiri, who is the Centennial Professor of Aeronautics and Mechanical Engineering at the California Institute of Technology. 
So this new research, which was recently published in the journal called Bioinspiration and Biomimetics, was led by John DeBiry, who is the Centennial Professor of Aeronautics and Mechanical Engineering at the California Institute of Technology. Now, Professor Dabiri has been working on augmented jellyfish for a while now, and his overall goal with this research is to use jellyfish as robotic data gatherers. The idea is to send these augmented jellyfish into the oceans to collect a variety of oceanic information, including oxygen levels, temperature, salinity, and more. In previous research projects, this lab was able to successfully develop mechanical robots that were able to swim like jellyfish. But they didn't swim as efficiently as real jellyfish. So why not outfit real jellyfish with electronics? And that's exactly what they did. So first, this team from Caltech implanted jellyfish with an electronic pacemaker that would control how fast they could swim. And what they found was that this new pacemaker made the jellyfish swim faster than normal, about three times faster than their normal leisurely pace. From there, this team added a forebody to the jellyfish. Now, these four bodies are like hats. They sit on top of the jellyfish's bell, that mushroom-shaped part of the jellyfish. The idea here was to provide a place where sensors and other electronics could be placed without affecting the movement of the animal. A Caltech graduate student and the lead author of this study explains the forebody like this. Much like the pointed end of an arrow, we designed 3D printed forebodies to streamline the bell of the jellyfish robot, reduce drag, and increase swimming performance. At the same time, we experimented with 3D printing until we were able to carefully balance the buoyancy and keep the jellyfish swimming vertically. So how would you go about testing these new devices to see if they would work in the deepest parts of the ocean? By building a giant fish tank. This team actually built a massive vertical aquarium inside Caltech's Guggenheim Laboratory. This three-story fish tank is meant to replicate the several thousand meter trip that one of these augmented jellyfish could take. And this kind of vertical tank actually lets the animal swim against a flowing vertical current. And what their tests found in this monumental fish tank was that when the jellyfish were equipped with a combination of that swimming pacemaker and the forebody, they could swim 4.5 times faster than a normal jellyfish while carrying the same payload. And the cost? Well, this team says that the total cost was around $20 per jellyfish, which is way cheaper than any kind of other deep sea research vehicle currently in use today. The next part of this project is to deal with pressure. Jellyfish have a natural capacity to withstand the extreme pressures of the deep ocean. But the sensors in that forebody, well, they need some help with that. So this team is working on designing a sensor package that is small enough to outfit in that forebody, but can also deal with the extreme pressure of deep sea conditions as well. They are also working on making these bionic jellyfish swim faster in vertical paths and possibly making them steerable as well. Professor Dabiri sums up the importance of this research like this. He says, It's well known that the ocean is critical for determining our present and future climate on land. And yet, 
we still know surprisingly little about the ocean, especially away from the surface. Our goal is to finally move that needle by taking an unconventional approach inspired by one of the few animals that already successfully explores the entire ocean. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about these new bionic jellyfish from Caltech and even a video of these augmented bad boys in action, or if you'd like more information about animals around the globe, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I completely dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we're now also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some super exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of March 8th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>